Hello, my name is Katarina Pavinsky, and I'm a hematologist at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. And today I will be talking to you about diagnosis of TTP. There will be other lectures that would highlight pathophysiology and management, as well as other aspects of treating TTP patients. I also want to point out that a lot of the things that I will be talking about are referred to in the recently published ISTH evidence-based guidelines, as well as the best practices document. Today, I will start with a case that highlights a diagnostic challenge. This is a 25-year-old female who presented to the emergency room with quote-unquote abnormal test result. She saw her family doctor about two days ago because her period was unusually heavy. He ordered some laboratory tests and today instructed her to go to the emergency room for assessment. Her past medical history is generally unremarkable. Uh, she does have a history of iron deficiency anemia. She is not on any medications and she does not take any illicit drugs. And clinically, she looks really well. In fact, she is wondering why she is there. Physical exam is also unremarkable, except for a few petechia that are obvious over her lower extremities. Laboratory investigations indicate mild to moderate anemia, hemoglobin of 10.1 gram per deciliter, severe thrombocytopenia with a platelet count of 10, mildly elevated reticulocyte count at 107, definitely appropriate for her anemia, bilirubin that is just on the upper limit of normal, and otherwise normal liver enzymes and creatinine, normal coagulation studies, and a negative pregnancy test. At this point, the emergency physician very appropriately refers her to a hematologist on call who orders additional laboratory investigations. The first investigation that the hematologist does is a blood film. And the red blood cell morphology on the blood film is completely normal. There are no fragments. Severe thrombocytopenia is confirmed, and there's nothing to indicate acute leukemia. Her LDH surprisingly comes up as quite elevated, more than to upper limits of normal. And this is what happens. She gets admitted to a general medical ward with a diagnosis of ITP. She started on dexamethasone, 40 milligrams once daily. And 24 hours later, unfortunately, she suffers very significant clinical deterioration. She is agitated, she's confused. Her hemoglobin is worse, even though she's not bleeding anywhere. Her LDH is even higher now, and her heptoglobin comes back undetectable, highly suggestive of hemolysis. Her direct antiglobulin test or direct Coombs test is negative, and her PNH test is negative as well. And at this point, we are pulling out all of her blood films that have been done since her admission, and we notice that she's developing progressively more red blood cell fragmentation. But first and foremost, let's talk about how TTP presents. So TTP presents with microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, and microvascular thrombosis. Microangiopathic hemolytic anemia is defined by the presence of low hemoglobin or anemia, evidence of hemolysis, as well as presence of fragments or schistocytes on the blood film. And that's what you can see on the panel on the right. Um, you can see a blood film that is typical of a patient with TTP. You can witness some of the normal red cells that have central pallor. You have reticulocytosis. There is significant paucity of platelets here. And then you clearly see the fragments. These patients also have thrombocytopenia and microvascular thrombosis, usually in the heart, brain, and kidney. However, other organs may also be affected. TTP is a type of thrombotic microangiopathy, or TMA. Now, clinical presentation of TTP is highly heterogeneous. In fact, one of the researchers in the field of TTP remarked on its quote-unquote remarkable diversity. We were all taught, at least those of us who are older, that you should look for a PANTED to diagnose TTP, which is the presence of thrombocytopenia, hemolytic anemia, neurological and renal complications, as well as fever. But I would argue that PANTED may not occur in all patients, and when it does occur, it may occur 
much later in the disease course once significant organ damage uh, has been sustained. And therefore, it is not wise to search for PANTAD, but instead question the diagnosis of TTP in anyone presenting with unexplained thrombocytopenia and hemolytic anemia. It is also important to point out that some patients with TTP appear clinically quite well at the beginning, and they may very rapidly turn on you. On the other hand, some patients may be presenting critically ill right off the bat. Some of the unusual presentations of TTP may be with abdominal pain or palpitations. People may notice that they have dark urine, that they have developed uh, bruising. It is also important to point out that TTP may coexist with other conditions. And sometimes the simplest sole explanations, so-called Occam's razor, um, is not necessarily the correct one. So I promised you I'm going to come back to the acute target organ damage suffered by patients who present with TTP. And here they are, heart, brain, and kidney. As I pointed out earlier, other organs may also be involved, but these organs tend to be injured more frequently than others. About half of patients may have abnormal cardiac enzymes and suffer ischemia infarction as well as arrhythmias. More than half may have neurological abnormalities, and in some cases it may be quite mild as headache. In other cases, it would be much more severe as a focal neurological event, all the way to seizures and altered level of consciousness. It's interesting to point out also that the appearance of TTP on imaging is also quite heterogeneous, ranging from microangiopathic changes to microbleeds to full territorial infarctions. And finally, about 50% would have acute kidney injury stage one or higher. Most importantly, without treatment, TTP is rapidly organ and life-threatening. In fact, without appropriate and rapid treatment, TTP is fatal in the overwhelming majority of cases. Now let's talk about who gets TTP and how frequent is this condition? So there have been a number of studies and um, one study indicates that thrombotic microangiopathy, so this undifferentiated presentation of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, perhaps with organ damage, is quite rare, about four cases per million. Out of those cases, the incidence of acquired or immune TTP is probably closer to two cases per million. TTP mainly affects adults, specifically women in their reproductive years, third to fifth decades of life, with a female to male ratio of about three to one. Being obese and black has also been linked to increased risk of TTP. I am not going to be discussing TTP pathophysiology in detail. There will be other lectures covering this. But for the purposes of discussing TTP diagnosis, it is really important to point out that TTP is defined by severe ADAMTS13 deficiency. ADAMTS13 is a disintegrin and metalloprotease with thrombospondin type 1 motif 13. It is a protein that cleaves von Willebrand factor within the central A2 domain, preventing um, von Willebrand factor from becoming very, very large. Severe deficiency is defined as activity of less than 10% or less than 0.1 units. You can have deficiency of ADAMTS13 because you have a defect in the ADAMTS13 gene, and this is a hallmark of hereditary TTP, which is quite rare. On the other hand, the overwhelming majority of cases are the result of immune TTP or deficiency due to IgG autoantibody. The IgG autoantibody tends to bind to the spacer domain of ADAMTS13 and can either prevent ADAMTS13 from functioning properly or participate in its enhanced clearance. Now, when you're faced with a patient with thrombotic microangiopathy or a finding of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and thrombocytopenia, and especially if your patient is an adult, and I have to say that my most important disclosure is that I am an adult hematologist and I do not look after children, and I would imagine children will be 
a lot different. The diagnosis is quite extensive. You could be dealing with a patient who has TTP. You could be dealing with a patient who has either shigatoxin-associated hemolytic uremic syndrome or perhaps complement-mediated or atypical hemolytic syndrome. Uh, you can be dealing with someone with DIC. And there is a long list of secondary TMAs, which are listed in the right uh, panel, and there could potentially be more than what is already listed there. The most significant ones to consider would be malignant hypertension, help, uh, autoimmune diseases, complications of drugs of abuse, as well as medications, malignancy, et cetera. To make matters worse, there are not only many TMAs, there are also a number of mimickers, things that look like you may have a TMA or a TTP. Vitamin B12 deficiency, for example, endocarditis, Evans syndrome, autoimmune diseases, et cetera, et cetera. And at first, it may seem like a very daunting task, and it is. However, the most important question to ask yourself, could the patient in front of you have TTP? And if the answer is yes, then you have to treat them as TTP while you are investigating. And again, the reason for that is that TTP is rapidly organ damaging and potentially life-threatening. I specifically want to talk about thrombocytopenia and thrombotic microangiopathy in pregnancy. It is important to point out that in pregnant women with a platelet count of less than 100, a cause other than pregnancy or its complications should be considered. Severe thrombocytopenia due to pregnancy-related complications alone is quite rare. It is also important to point out that there are a number of conditions that present with what either looks like or is thrombotic microangiopathy in pregnancy. And this could include preeclampsia and help, as well as things that are exacerbated by pregnancy sometimes, such as lupus, uh, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, TTP, HUS. And therefore, severe thrombocytopenia or worsening thrombocytopenia towards end of pregnancy on postpartum should prompt investigation for TTP. But how can you tell? And that may be quite difficult. If I use an example of preeclampsia and HELP versus TTP, you will see that HELP is not that uncommon, one to six per thousand pregnancies. And these patients usually present with uh, significant elevation in their blood pressure. They have um, significant elevation in liver enzymes. And usually we say there is no diagnostic test, although certainly there are uh, some promising biomarkers that can help with diagnosis. And usually preeclampsia um, and or help usually uh, resolve within 48 to 72 hours of delivery without any other specific treatment. In contrast, if you take TTP, it's much more rare. Blood pressure is usually not as elevated or may not be elevated at all. Thrombocytopenia is usually more severe. Uh, there is very significant elevations in hemolytic markers, whereas liver enzymes may be completely normal. And the defining feature is ADMTS-13 activity of less than 10%. So at presentation, there are some clues that may help you identify one versus the other, although if there is a strong suspicion of underlying TTP, uh, you should order ADMTS-13 testing and treat as TTP. Now, what about prediction score for TTP diagnosis? So there are actually two that have been published. Um, one is a French score uh, published by Paul Coppo originally, and it includes just two variables, platelet count and the serum creatinine level. And then there is more recently published a plasmic score from the United States, which includes platelet count, uh, serum creatinine level, as well as hemolytic markers, some uh, history points, coagulation, et cetera. And uh, when you add the points together, it purports to predict uh, who is likely to have severe ADMTS-13 deficiency. Now, whether you use a prediction score or you're quite savvy at treating and diagnosing TTP, TTP is first and foremost a clinical diagnosis. So this means that you should not be waiting for ADMTS-13 confirmation. And if you think that the story fits with TTP, you should be treating it as TTP. And in general, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia with low platelets, especially if there is presence of organ damage, especially if there is no immediately obvious alternative explanation, should be treated as TTP until proven otherwise. So here's how I approach diagnosis of TTP. 
If I'm faced with a patient with suspected thrombotic microangiopathy, suspected TTP, first and foremost, I take time to confirm presence of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and thrombocytopenia. So I would look at CBC and specifically at hemoglobin and platelets looking for anemia and thrombocytopenia. I will then order a blood film specifically looking for fragmentation and ruling out their pathologies. In terms of hemolytic markers, this is a pretty exhaustive list. And um, what I would suggest is find out which markers are done at your hospital, uh, which markers have a fast turnaround time, and which markers are you most comfortable with. So my favorite markers is LDH and heptoglobin. However, I do understand that heptoglobin may not necessarily be uh, immediately available in some hospitals. So find out what is available, what works for you, uh, which marker are you most comfortable with interpreting to assess for hemolysis. The next step is to look for target organ damage. And most of it can be accomplished with just doing a quick history and physical exam. To assess the heart, the best test would be a troponin or cardiac enzymes. You can also do electrocardiogram or an echocardiogram, time permitting. Electrocardiogram or cardiac monitoring is specifically important in patients who are presenting with arrhythmias. In terms of assessment of kidney, I usually do a creatinine as well as I look for presence of proteinuria and hemoglobinuria on urinalysis. ACR stands for albumin creatinine ratio. In terms of evaluation of the neurological complications, I think a quick physical exam and history are probably the most useful. Now, CT MRI may be quite helpful with MRI being more helpful than CT, um, but may take time. And if there is a concern that imaging your patient may delay starting treatment, and in this case, plasmapheresis for a patient with suspected TTP, I would delay imaging until after uh, treatment has been initiated. And then I do a quick differential diagnosis. Is there an immediate obvious reason why this person may have TMA um, and um, that is not TTP? So I look for presence of malignant hypertension. I can look at the possibility of them having DIC by ordering coagulation tests. You can look for vitamin B12 deficiency. Vitamin B12 level is uh, very quick to obtain, especially if the history fits with someone who might be at risk for vitamin B12 deficiency. To rule out Evans syndrome, direct antiglobulin or direct Coombs test would be quite helpful. And then of course, endocarditis, sepsis, and shigatoxin associated HUS, you're gonna be looking for a classical history presentation as well as doing appropriate cultures and other investigations. If you cannot rule out TTP or you're not sure, I would argue that you should send off ADMTS-13 testing and treat a patient with TTP. If you do not have experience dealing with patients with TTP, please reach out to one of the consultants who have the experience in managing TTP for their advice. Now, I've mentioned ADMTS-13 testing quite a few times, so I want to spend some time talking about what I mean when I say send off ADMTS-13 testing. So, ADMTS-13 activity is probably the most useful test that you can perform acutely. It is very important to collect ADMTS-13 activity sample prior to administration of any plasma or performing uh, plasma exchange. ADMTS-13 activity, first and foremost, confirms diagnosis of TTP. Severe deficiency, less than 10%, activity has very high specificity for TTP. On the other hand, moderate deficiency in the range of 20 to 30% may be seen in other thrombotic microangiopathies. We also use ADMTS-13 to confirm treatment response or determine whether we need to escalate uh, the current treatment. And that is because persistent low ADMTS-13 was associated with uh, exacerbation. Now, once your patient is recovered, if you measure their ADMTS-13 in remission, and it is low, that low activity is associated with relapse. And finally, most recently, in patients with TTP who are in remission and who were found to have low ADMTS-13, low ADMTS-13 was also associated with a higher risk of stroke. 
and that is regardless of whether they suffer a relapse or not. So in other words, low ADMTS13 in remission identifies patients at high risk. Now, what about ADMTS13 antibody or inhibitor? Well, its main purpose is to differentiate immune versus hereditary TTP. So if it is negative on a few occasions and a clinical course is consistent with hereditary TTP, then of course the next step would be to order ADMTS13 genetics. ADMTS13 antigen, its utility is still a bit controversial, although a recent study suggested that low antigen and high antibody are predictive of increased TTP-related mortality as well as cardiac and uh, neurological complications. So we may be using ADMTS13 antibody and ADMTS13 antigen more than we do so now. There's also a new test that looks at the confirmation of ADMTS13, and we're still studying its potential applications to practice. Just a few more words about ADMTS13 testing. So as I said, ADMTS13 activity is probably the most important one to have acutely. It is not a routine test for most laboratories. Um, some of you may need to have it sent out. And whether your lab performs it or it's a send out test, your turnaround time may exceed 24 to 48 hours, which means that it is fundamentally important to start treating patient and not waiting to decide whether you're going to treat this patient or not, waiting for ADMTS13 to occur. It is also important to point out ADMTS13 testing has quite a few methods, and these methods should be appropriately validated and appropriately quality controlled. And ideally, your lab um, should be doing external proficiency. What if ADMTS13 testing not consistent with TTP? So it's somewhere in the gray zone between 10% and 40% uh, and can signify presence of another TMA or it may be solidly normal above 40%. Well, some things that you may consider would be complement-mediated hemolytic uremic syndrome, in which case uh, ordering complement tests may be quite useful. Uh, a number of infections can present with TMA. A classic one is um, HIV, also hepatitis C. There are others as well, and so ordering appropriate serology uh, might be very important. Doing a careful review of uh, history, so including history of transplantation, history of various medications and substances of abuse, Pancreatitis produces a quite significant TMA sometimes and actually consequently not associated with ADMTS13 deficiency, so it is not TTP and uh, seems to respond to plasma exchange, at least based on the uh, very small retrospective studies. We already talked quite a bit about uh, the necessity of investigating for help and preeclampsia and being aware of this very important differential diagnosis in uh, postpartum or patients who are very close to delivery. Malignancy is another very important one. So malignancy can either present with TMA or look like TMA uh, because of DIC, because of um, just its disseminated nature, because of invasion of the bone marrow by malignant cells or uh, by invasion of blood vessels. Of interest, not all patients would actually have a history of malignancy. Uh, quite frequently, investigation for a suspected TTP uh, have led to a diagnosis of um, a malignancy that was unbeknownst to the patient, but was quite advanced when it was found. And finally, autoimmune diseases, uh, especially lupus, especially scleroderma, especially antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Uh, they can coexist with TTP. They are a very significant differential diagnosis to TTP and uh, ordering autoimmune serology and consulting with an appropriate specialist may be quite important in deciphering these. It is also important to point out that with autoimmune diseases, it is very important to treat both the TTP, if TTP is present, as well as the underlying disease to achieve best outcomes for the patient. Let's go back to the case for a minute. So remember we we're dealing with a young woman who just had a bit of heavy periods, was seen by her family doctor, was sent for some blood work, which revealed severe thrombocytopenia and she was sent to the emergency room. And originally she was diagnosed as ITP. Uh, however, uh, she suffered quite significant deterioration on just high dose steroids alone. 
and subsequent testing revealed that she had fragmentation hemolysis. Her MTS-13 testing was sent and she was started on appropriate treatment without waiting for the result. But eventually her MTS-13 activity returned at 2% or 0.02 units. And her inhibitor was uh, positive with a titer of more than 15. So her final diagnosis is immune thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. And so in conclusion, I just wanted to highlight a few things as take-home lessons or take-home points. First and foremost, remember that TTP presents with microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and thrombocytopenia. Do not wait for other manifestations. Question the diagnosis of TTP in anyone presenting like this. Remember also that differential diagnosis may be quite extensive, especially in an adult patient with comorbidities. Severe ADMTS-13 deficiency confirms diagnosis of TTP. However, TTP can cause death or severe organ damage if not treated early and appropriately, and therefore it is paramount to treat and not wait for ADMTS-13 result. If you are faced with a patient who is presenting with new significant thrombocytopenia, always order hemolytic markers, always look at their blood film. Remember also, just like in our case, there will be an occasional patient where red blood cell fragmentation may not be initially present or obvious. And in those cases, ordering further investigations and considering serial blood films may be the answer. Finally, clinical presentation of TTP is highly heterogeneous. A patient with TTP may look well or be critically ill, and those who look well may turn critically ill quite fast. TTP may coexist with other conditions, specifically pregnancy-related complications such as preeclampsia or lupus, which makes the diagnosis more difficult. Remember, patient may have more than one disorder. A patient with TTP may certainly present with thrombosis. However, initially, they may also have mucocutaneous bleeding. Thank you for your attention.